Well, thank you. Thank you very much uh, for having me here tonight. For me, it's a great honor to be what I have been explained to be like the close FFI family, the close FFI supporter. And I was, I, I'm, I get really nervous when I have to talk in front of people, even though I know, and I know that they, they support our work. But that is the reason, I, because I'm nervous, because I feel I own you, because I feel I, you have a commitment, and we share some goals. And now I have to, you know, bring a little bit of account on what I'm doing. It has been 12 years since I've been working with FFI, and it has been a wonderful personal journey. I have learned a lot through the opportunity that this organization gave me to work on sea turtle conservation in my country, in my place. So now I would like to share a little bit of, of the work there, of our work with there. And this is a is not my presentation. It's a presentation that belongs to all our team, and especially to the team that is working in Nicaragua including Edgar that is now heading the, the, the country, uh, the country program, and all the people that at this moment, taking into account the, the time difference, maybe is starting to prepare the work to start working on the nesting areas. So, what I would like to, to, to do is to use a little bit of your imagination. And now, I would like you to invite you to travel with me to the Pacific coast of Nicaragua, to this wonderful place called Chacosente, and it's a small strip of sand between a dense and wild dry forest and this vast Pacific Ocean. And you, in this moment, are watching the sunset. And you see the sky painted with oranges and purples and blue colors, and you are really enjoying this moment of the day. But at the same time, as the sun starts to disappear, you feel this nostalgia. You, f you have this feeling of lost, because this, that this something really wonderful is going out. But then you feel better, because you know that tomorrow there will be another sunset, maybe a little bit different. But you have but the same wonderful at this one. So are you using your imagination? Because now I would like to ask you something weird, something really weird. I want you to imagine that you shrink. You start to become smaller and smaller, 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 to uh, the size of more or less seven, in seven inches. And you are in a really dark place, but it's warm and un uncomfortable. But suddenly, you feel this uncontainable need of going out. You are a hatchling inside a, an egg. And you break the shell of the eggs. And you have just three inches, and you have maybe two feet of sand over you. And so you have to try to dig out on the surface, and you see that you are alone, but then you realize that you are not alone. There are other dozens of hatchlings, your sisters and your brother, that are pushing and pulling together with you in a collaborative way to emerge together. And it's a tough, really tough job. It will take maybe two or three days in this really hostile and anoxy an oxic environment. But finally, you do it. <laughs> you emerge. And then, here you go. You are in the sand, and now start this frenzy race towards the ocean. 200 feet of sand seems a little bit of a, a small thing for us, but it's really huge for us baby turtle. And then, you are racing with your, friend, your friends, your brothers and sisters, and then, they come, the vultures, and the crabs, and the raccoons, and some of your sister and your brother will fall. But you continue going and going and going into the ocean. And then you get into the ocean, and you have this 
big waves and the water and the breaking point, and you start to swim and swim and swim until you reach and you pass the breaking point. And after the breaking point, here we go. Seagulls, shark, fish. <laughs> it's tough. But you continue swimming and swimming and swimming for maybe two, three days until you get to those currents. And these currents will get you hundreds, maybe thousands of miles far from the place you were born to the places where you will float in, in what the biologists call the lost year. Nobody exactly knows what happened with the baby turtles in that year. But you will be floating, <laughs> trying to find salt food in the ocean, and growing the faster as you can. Because as faster you grow, so you escape of the predators. And then, after that year, you will be like a juvenile. You will be growing, and you will move to other places where you continue eating and growing. And you will feed on really strange things. Jellyfish, sponges. Few animals in the world feed on, on those things. But they succeed, and succeed in such a great way that they grow until 25 times the length when they were hatchlings, and 25,000 times the, the weight they, they were when they were hatching. And now, you are a big female turtle 25 years after. And as the same day, when you feel that uncontainable need to emerge in the nest, now you feel that uncontainable need to go back to the place you were born. That behavior is called by biologists philopatry. Philopatry means love to your place, love to your home. And so navigating in the ocean using the magnetic, magnetic file of the earth, using the stars, using the sunset, using the currents, you will be able to go back to that nesting beach that you abandoned 25 years before. And you will, you will do that, and you will get into the beach, and you will be now a nesting female, and you will lay the eggs, and then you will continue this cycle that has been running in the air for millions, hundreds of millions of years. This to me, obviously since I started, was a mesmerizing story, a story that talks about persistence, a, to a story that talks about endurance, about tribe, about connection, about wis wisdom. It's amazing how these animals do, do. And it talks about love. But unfortunately, now, when these turtles get to the place, they will have to face one of the most efficient predators that has inhabit the earth, humans. And unfortunately, we have been poaching their eggs so efficiently for decades that we, we have been contributing, contributing to the collapse of many of their populations. So in that moment, you realize that when you see a turtle, you have that feeling that you had when you, see the, you saw the sunset. But this time, you don't know if there is going to be another opportunity, if there's gonna, gonna be another sunset. So to illustrate a little bit this dramatic situation, we can use a, as an example the Eastern Pacific leatherback population. Here, you can see the number of nests laid per year in three of the different nesting beaches and the, the accumulative total in Mexico, Nicaragua, and Costa Rica. And you can see that in 82, when the, when the collapse was already on, ongoing, how the number of nests has dropped from 3,000 to 200. And the trend is going. And this is, a, this is a, a combination of several factors. 
bycatch, the interaction with fisheries, pollution, coastal development, and the poaching of the eggs. And in this situation, if we continue eating all the eggs, so we will be losing our chances to recover this population. But it will be unfair to blame to the people of the coastal communities of Nicaragua about this problem. These people have to face, for several reasons, historical and social, economical issues, they have to face poverty. And sometimes they cannot afford the luxury that conservation means to them. I learned that in a hard way. When I was young, well, younger, I'm still young, no. I met Doña Hilda, I was starting this work. I met Doña Hilda, a poacher, a grandmother now, six children, uh, and, sing, uh, and, and like nine uh, grandsons. And, and maybe in a, in a maybe some sort of, you know, suburb attitude, I, I encourage her and I ask her, what, what does sea turtles mean to you? What does the ocean mean to you? And she told me this, I'm never going to forget. You young boy, you know what the ocean means to me. I'm going to tell you what the ocean means to me. When I have to feed my kids, the ocean helped me to feed them. When I have to heal my kids, my children, because they, they were in pain, the ocean helped me to buy, buy the medicine. When I, need, when I needed to send my children to school and buy the, the school supplies, the ocean helped me. So that explained to you what the ocean means to me. And then I fell down from my pedestal. And I realized what we, ever know, what we all know, that we need to work with people. And we, we have to understand their aspirations and their needs. But it's not all about poverty. It's not just poverty. And I, I want to be clear about that. This guy does do not have economical problems. You know, these guys are doing well, are doing quite well. They are in the cities and they are demanding the true legs. So they are part of the problem because they are eager to pay for the true legs. And if you want to see that picture and how this picture show you a little bit of the complex of the situation, I have to admit that these guys are not ordinary guys. They are congressmen in Nicaragua. And this picture was taken in 2007, and this guy approved the laws that made Turulex trade illegal in 2005. And this was a public event. So we have a lot of things to deal with. And I, I tempted to say that this is more or less, if you forget about the turtles, this is more or less the, the the context and the issues FFI is working across the globe. Uh, you can talk about, it can be the same about tigers, it can, it can be the same about gorillas, it can, it can be the same about crocodiles, it can be the same about protecting the choco forest or a coral reef. We need, but even though as a turtle biologist and it's not just because I am a turtle biologist, and I know you will share with me this opinion. We need to focus in one species. And this species is sometimes out of focus. It's this one. A single species is the one we need to work. So, what do we do with sea turtles in Nicaragua? I will go fastly for five components of our work. In the case of sea turtle conservation, as you was seen in, in the video, um, the, the backbone of our program is the research and protection of, of the nesting beaches. 
And the first thing we, we need to do is obviously to find those nesting areas. And to find those nesting areas, we, um, we, um, we, we ask the local people. That is a really valuable source of information. But sometimes, especially in isolated places, we use planes to overfly the, the coastline at uh, a low altitude. And then we spot those, tra those tracks in the, in the sand, those are nests, nest, a leatherback nest. So when a leatherback is so big, a leatherback can be like 1,000 pounds and two and a half meters, that when they go into the beach, it's, it seems like a caterpillar went into the beach. So you can spot, spot the net, nest from the air. And then, following the really fancy working styles of FFI, we take our expensive four-wheel four cars to go to those places. I am using one of them. <laughs> we have a fleet of those. And then, as you will see in the video, we engage the community to be the conservationists, to be the one that will patrol the, the nesting beaches, to be the one that will run the hatcheries. The hatchery is a really simple structure. We enclose an area of beach, we clean that area of beach, and we relocate the eggs. So we can pass from this to this. And we started, well, this is the map of Nicaragua. And uh, Obviously, Central America, we, we have on the north Honduras, South Costa Rica, and this is all our working area. Um, we started in this place called Chacocente, working with leatherbacks, and the program has been growing and replicated in five different places, covering more or less 45 kilometers of beaches, and also doing capacity building, are replicating in all those different places that you can see in blue. Working with four different species, with Ollie Ridley protected more or less between 50,000 and 70,000 uh, nests per year and releasing millions of hatchings per year. With the ladderbacks, protected the few ones we have and trying to keep that population stable and helping to go up with the black turtle and with the hawksbill. And as you saw in the video, the, this hawksbill was a recent finding, and it, it, it came that this was the most important nesting area in all the Eastern Pacific. And all the, the eggs were poached until four years ago, and now we are protected, protecting 100% of those eggs. And the most important things, these are the authors of this presentation, and they deserve the credit for all this hard work. Pull, pulling together teams, helping facilitating the local initiative, several groups, hundreds, I would say hundreds of people now, working on sea turtle conservation in these different areas in Nicaragua. The next component, as you saw in the video, is education. Nicaragua is a young country. In 2008, uh, a study showed that 70% of Nicaragua population were under 35 years old. So this is a big opportunity for the country. And also, it's a big opportunity for us. But to capitalize that opportunity, we need to do a lot of work with the young generation. And it involves a lot of work with the kids, as you saw in, in the, with the children, you saw in the video, and also with young people. And with young people, we have been trying to spread the message of sea turtle conservation to the rest of the population. But I would like to do a, a side note, a side note <laughs> uh, here about the relevance of education. Uh, this is me with my daughter, Camila, when she was 
four years old, I think. And I, I say, I have to show her a turtle. I have to show her a turtle I, and a leather bag. So I, 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 I walk with her like the two and a half miles of the, of the nesting beach in this one area to find this leather bag. Found, we camped there. And then when the leather bag came to nest, I had the opportunity to share with her this wonderful creature. She was a little bit scared, to be honest. <laughs> but then when she, when she saw the hatchlings, she was really, really happy. And somebody asked me, what is what you enjoy more about working with sea turtles? And I say, yeah, I love to swim with them. I love to see one turtle nesting. But what I more like about working with turtles is when you share this with others. When you share, see the, the smile, in this case of my daughter, of other kids. But then I realized that what has happened with kids, it also happened with adults. So sea turtles and other wild, I'm sure dugans also do that, <laughs> <clears throat> have this amazing capacity of bringing out the, the children we have inside. And this is something that really worth to protect. So we do these festivals, big turtle parties, trying to organize at least one each year in the places we are working to celebrate the proud, to, to, you know, to empower ourselves about what we have. And then we take the message to the cities, because remember those congressmen. So we need to do the campaign. We need to spread the message. And through this campaign that has been running so successfully for the last more than five years now, we have made a big change on how young people is seeing sea turtles in their country. If you see the statistics, it's like young people in this moment, like 80% more than the, than the all, all the segments are aware of sea turtle conservation. And we are having a big impact in the public. And you can measure that impact when you don't see any more congressmen eating turtle legs on TV. And obviously, when I started my, my, my presentation, we were talking about uh, the, the livelihoods. Uh, and, and an important part of the, 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 the problem here is the economy. No? It's, it's looking on a source of income that will replace the income that sea turtles were providing to those communities. So we have been working a lot on developing this alternative agriculture product. We have been working with honey uh, beekeeping and the production of honey and with uh, tourism in the, in the local communities. And one project that has been really successful is this group of, of, of women of the community. They, they have formed a cooperative. And they are recycling grocery plastic bags. And they are turning these grocery plastic bags in these beautiful products that they are selling to turtles, customers. And obviously, we have to put all this information together and to develop plans and to develop agreements and to visualize the next steps, and to have a consensus and agreement between all the stakeholders in our country to try to develop the strategies, the management plan, the networking, to continue with this work. That is a long-term work. And the last one is the hatchery. And I would like to take this. This is not the hatchery I saw you for, but it's a quite similar hatchery. And I would like to take this moment as a tribute to all my partners in FFI. And it's where <laughs> the guys that are in the field think, you know, we, we have a tremendous support of the people working here or maybe in the office in Managua from people that may sometimes spend more time in front of a computer. So sometimes we think that conservation is just about jumping in the turtle and having the hatchling, but this a lot of work to be done on you know, putting that planning together, all those messy ideas in black and white, 
and delivering proposals and doing the reporting and the communication and organizing this event. And, and this is a hatchery. You know, it's where you take the eggs. No, it's the main idea. And you create the environment so that allow us to hatch. And there is another tremendous component of the hatchery. And it's this one. Is people, as many of you, that support with funds that we need to continue our work. And the closest example for me is the example of Orna Beard. This person that, when she was 20 years old, had the magic encounters in the water of Mexico diving with a lot of actual. And that encounter marked her for the rest of her life. So sometimes later, she met FFI, and she decided she wanted to help protect the wonder, wonder reptiles in the earth. And then, it were in the hatchery, all the pieces started to put together. And then it's like projects, like the one I, I, I have been, I have had the honor to, to live, can be a reality. So how do we measure our impact? And I can tell, I, I told you about the number of turtles and the number of hatching, but I, I wanted to, to share with you another story. It's the story of Juan Manuel. When I started going to Veracruz Beach, with, where the, when we were st starting the Leatherback project, uh, there was this poacher, Juan Manuel. And, you know, he also was a community leader. And we recruited them without being sure if it was going to work. And since then, he has been doing this wonderful job. And this picture was taken that first year when we spot the first leatherback. After walking that nesting beach for one month without seeing a, sing, seeing a single leatherback. So we were really happy. And that's Juan Manuel today. He's still working in the program. He is leader, leading the, the conservation project in that nesting beach. But more than that, he decided he wanted to go in poli politics and he became a counselor of his municipality. And now he is fighting in his municipality so the municipality invests some part of the budget in situ conservation in his place. And this is the kind of success we are trying to achieve. So the title of the presentation was Sticking Our Necks Out. And, and I was like, oh, cause what does it mean? <laughs> so I, I, I know that the sticking of, or, or necks out is about taking risk. It's about, you know, giving a step forward and going into the unknown zone. And that led me to me to the question of what is conservation about? What is conservation about? And yeah, conservation is about the science, about the protection, it's about the education, it's about the management and the policy, it's about the livelihoods, but it's about something else. It's about connections. It's about the connection we do with our history and our future and how are going to commit to protect that. It's about the connection we do between people in the UK and people in a community in Nicaragua or in Virginia and a, a wisdom woman in Virginia and a wisdom woman in, in, in Chaco Sente, both trying to help the turtles. It's a connection we do with the, the next generation. It's about thrive. It's about endurance. It's about friendship. It's about a struggle. It's about 
persistence. It's about, about not giving up. And why not? It's about love, too. And then, it what you realize that all those qualities we were projecting the trolls before are those qualities we are trying to recover for ourselves, human beings. And then is when you realize that maybe we are helping the turtles, but the turtles are helping us too. Thank you. <laughs>